Well, everyone, thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, we're doing a, a series of workshops in conjunction with Air Force Research Lab to talk about the SBIR, STTR programs, and kind of to do a focus on what does it actually mean to the Air Force? What are the opportunities with AFRL? Because there's some really unique opportunities under the civil programs. And the third um, workshop in the series, which should fall in November, is going to be kind of that focused how do I put together a good and compelling proposal package? So it's actually going to be a writing workshop. We'll make sure to um, push out information about this entire series as it gets closer. The second workshop is tentatively scheduled for October 30th. We're still trying to nail that down, but we will let you all know. So this is the brief outline. I'm going to provide a little bit of basis about what are the um, SBIR and STTR programs and really why do they make sense for small business? Why are they such a great tool that the government utilizes to put money into innovative ideas that have commercial potential and commercial merit? And we're going to talk briefly about the Department of Defense and the Air Force, because the Department of Defense is one of the agencies that actually funds the SBIR and STTR programs, and USAF has a pretty large presence within there. Uh, across the DOD, it's not only the three main branches, Air Force, Navy, and Army, that actually fund, but a lot of the service components. So like Defense Health Agency, Defense Logistics Agency, I want to say off the top of my head, there's 13 total service components that actually fund under the SBIR and STTR programs through the DOD, but there will be a slide about that. So if I just lied, you'll figure that out in about 20 minutes. And then I'm going to talk about the NMFAST program and what we are, who we are, and what we do. Uh, to give you a quick introduction so that it doesn't get really weird where I don't talk about who I am until three quarters of the way through the presentation. My name is Del Mackey. I work for New Mexico State University through the Arrowhead Center. So the Arrowhead Center is the Entrepreneurship Development Center, actually at NMSU. We work with small businesses all across the state really to help them get to that next stage, that next phase of evolution for them, that next commercial step. Uh, we have a bunch of different programs that actually focus on that, whether it's student entrepreneurship, so students that have business ideas that want to get help on establishing themselves, there's programming for that. It's also programming for established businesses that are looking to find out really who their customer is, do customer market segmentation, that kind of customer interviews, customer interface and even to the NMFAST program, which we'll talk about, but we are funded by the SBA to help small businesses across New Mexico go after SBIR and STTR funding. If you are a small business located in New Mexico and you want to put together a civil proposal package, you just don't know where to start, you come to us. Everything that we offer is free because we are funded by the um, SBA um, on an annual basis through a cooperative agreement. We just got notification of our uh, fifth award, so coming up uh, starting technically September 30th, because they offset their calendar in some very weird fashion, uh, we will be providing another year of service um, through that cooperative agreement. So that'll be the fifth year that we've been doing this. The program's evolved over time, and we just hope that we continue to evolve to kind of keep up to date with all the changes coming through the program and make the most of the tools and resources that y'all need. So real quick, what is the um, SBIR program? Well, the SBIR program is the Small Business Innovative Research Program. It's a federal funding opportunity to just essentially drive innovation from small businesses. Um, it's actually one of the only sources of funding that the government has that can inject research and development dollars into small businesses. You know, most of their R&D dollars usually go into things like research institutes, like New Mexico State University, our UNM, our New Mexico Tech, our other areas, um, or even their federally funded labs. But this provides a way for you to get money if you have an idea that is unique, innovative, and has commercial merit. If you can start a product off of your idea, and there's nothing out there like it, there might be funding available. So as a So 
So the SBR program um, has been around for a number of years now. It's about a $2.5 billion annual set aside. So about $2.5 billion is coming from the government and going into small businesses each year. Uh, up here, as you see, it's, oh, that, it's not going to work on LC. I'm going to do it. About 3.2% of the extramural research budget for agencies that have over $100 million in research dollars each year. So that's 12 agencies. We'll cover them in a couple more slides. But really the big thing to know about this chart is that, as you can see, the program continues to evolve year over year. So we don't have all of the um, numbers on there because it's been around for 22 years now. It'd be a hell of a long uh, table. Um, you wouldn't be able to read it. But as you can see, year over year, it actually increases. That's because the government knows that there's a lot of really great ideas coming out there and businesses need more and more funding. There's more and more small businesses that start up each year. So they need to actually put aside more money to go into these programs every year. There we go. So the STTR program is actually companion to the SBIR program. We'll get into the difference here. So the SBIR program is any agency that spends over $100 million in extramural research over here. That's 12 agencies. Technically not 12 agencies, it's 11. Department of Commerce splits theirs into two. Um, NIST, which is the National Institute of Science and Technology, and um, NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. But for the STTR um, program, it's any agency that spends over a billion dollars a year in extramural research. So automatically that means that the agencies that participate in the STTR program also participate in the SBR program. They're not mutually exclusive. <coughs> There's only five of them. Those are the big guys, the Department of Defense, NSF, NIH, NASA, and Department of Energy. So the biggest difference between the programs is under the SBIR program, with both of these programs, the small business will be the main awardee. They actually hold pretty much the power in these dynamics. Under the SBIR program, small business can do it all on their own. You can do 100% of the work, you can have 100% of the award, but you have the option. You may allow for up to 33% of the award to go to a qualified other organization, let's just call it, because it can be things like a research institution. So if you need special tooling, special equipment, special expertise that you don't have, you can partner with someone like NMSU or UNM through a sub-award. It can also be another small business. So if you have a partner that you're actually developing an idea with, you can give them a sub-award so that they can actually receive funding to help you kind of drive that innovation forward. Under the STTR program, that may turns into a must. So that's the biggest difference is under the STTR program, you must have a sub-award with a qualified research institution. So they use the term qualified research institution. To them, that means essentially anyone that gets federal R&D money. So that covers most educational institutions. That covers things like federally funded labs, so like Sandia, LANL, and any organization that gets research and development dollars from the government. It also changes the dynamic a little bit. So under the STTR program, there is a minimum of 40% of the award that has to go to the small business, a minimum of 30% of the award that has to go to the research institution. And now anybody that's a math whiz goes, that doesn't equal 100%, and that's correct. The other 30% can be split however you want. More of it can go to the research institution, more of it can go to the small business, or the 30% can go to another organization. They don't care. Those are just the metrics behind it. So a lot of people ask, well, what's the purpose of the STTR program? It seems kind of limited. Well, the outgrowth of the STTR program was really because there is a lot of great technology that is just sitting on shelves collecting dust. You go to an education institution and they have a lot of stuff that is great technology. 
you know, great inventions that they have patented, and they're just sitting there. Nobody's doing anything with it. So this program was envisioned <laughs> as a way for the small business to come in and try and commercialize that technology. It's not really the entire focus anymore, but good to actually know the history. So that's why there's a weird delineation between the two programs. So this is the participating agencies. As I mentioned, there's 12. You only see 11 here because the Department of Commerce is split into two. But the ones in gray are the STTR organizations. The ones in red are the SBIR organizations. For the small business, for most of the agencies that you're going to talk to or you're going to look at, this difference between them is very minute. However, for certain agencies, like for Department of Defense, there can actually be different topic areas between an SBIR and an STTR. So when you're looking at the topic areas, particularly for DOD, NASA not so much, um, NSF does not care, um, as we'll get into that here. But for DOD, know whether it's an STTR or SBIR. If it is an STTR, it's one of those things you're going to want to start working early because it can take a while to get those agreements in place because that research institution is going to have to submit their own budget, their own budget justification, and some sort of notice that, hey, we talked with this person. Yeah, we'll do this work for this portion of the award. That all has to go into your proposal package. Speaking from... Uh, actually, having been on both sides from a small business going after an award, working with a research institution to actually being part of a research institution, that process can take a while. If you wait until the very last minute, the likelihood of you being able to submit an STTR package without having talked to the institution first, slim to none. So keep that in mind. Now, with the two programs, you actually have two different mechanisms for funding. You have a grant and you have a contract. So there's a lot of differences between the grants and contracts. Really the big thing to know is grants are very open. So grants fall under agencies like NSF, NIH, um, USDA, because they're interested in a bunch of different technologies. They just want to see how science is going to move forward, how research is going to move forward. So that's why when you look at their topic areas, they cover a wide swath. Pretty much, and this is actually one of the things, when you look at NSF, even when you look at their topic areas, they tell you, I don't care what you're working on. Send it to me. If it's interesting, we'll fund it. Don't worry about your topic area. We'll find where it goes. However, on a contracting agency, they have very specific areas that they're looking at because they're trying to solve a problem. They have a very specific statement. They have a very specific mission that they need to solve. For DOD, they have an issue out in the field that's impacting the lives of warfighters. For NASA, they have something that they can't actually do with human astronauts. So they need to solve that issue. And ultimately, that means under a contracting agency, they're going to be your customer nine times out of ten. It doesn't preclude you from selling it to somebody else, but... They're funding this because they want a solution to a problem. Granting agencies, they're never going to buy it. And you could build the best widget in the world. NSF is not going to buy it for you or from you because that's just not the business that uh, NSF is in. DOD wants to buy it because they have a problem that they're trying to solve. Other big things to focus on between the difference between grants and contracts, besides kind of the scope of uh, what they're looking for and the solutions, and a little bit more about the kind of background baseball of it. With a granting agency, they're a lot more open to things like scope of work changes, to actually meeting requirements. Um, it's really kind of best foot forward. I did my best. Um, contracting agencies are, because they're trying to buy a solution from you at the end, they're a little more locked down on that. They want you to perform. Um, so it's kind of that just envelope of performance. As long as you put the best foot forward and as long as you do all your due diligence under a granting agency, usually you're all right. The contracting agency, they definitely want to know what happened, what went wrong, why couldn't you deliver this to us? So with both the SBIR and STTR programs and across all 12 agencies that fund under SBIR, the five agencies that fund under STTR, 
It's really a gated program. So you have three phases. Your phase one is testing out the feasibility. So you have this idea and you go, I think this can work. I think I can make a product out of it. Nobody else is doing it. I just want to know more about it. So under a phase one, it's anywhere between six and 12 months, anywhere between 100,000 to, the chart says 225, it's actually 250,000 now, um, to really kind of test out that concept, for you to look at the science behind it and do the research. A lot, I actually gave a talk yesterday on what does research mean under these programs because people go, well, I'm developing a product. Well, it's product research. Um, that's why the R, both in SBIR and STTR, stands for research. It's a very important part of this process. And there's overall about a 15% success rate for submissions. When I say that, people that aren't in academia go, well, 15% doesn't sound like really great odds. From an academic standpoint, I can tell you those are astronomical odds compared to a lot of the grant packages. I put in grant packages on awards that had about a 1% funding rate, and we thought that was a great rate. Um, so 15%, while it seems small, it's actually pretty good. As long as you have your science down, as long as you have kind of that research down, and as long as you know what you're talking about. So if you're successful for your phase one, you can move on to a phase two. So phase two is, I tested out this idea, I saw the feasibility, I have this concept, I need to make a prototype out of it. And it needs to be a market-ready prototype. Not a prototype at the end of the phase two that's held together by duct tape and bailing wire. They almost want you to be able to stamp them out in a process. So because you are developing a prototype, it's a little bit longer. Most of the phase twos are about 24 months. And it's a little bit more money. Uh, it goes from a floor of 300K, I don't pay attention to what's on the slide, to about 2.25 million. Again, pay attention to what's on the slide. But these have about a 45% win rate across the board. That is because, with very, very limited exceptions, you have to have a successful phase one before you can go on to a phase two. There are some programs like a direct to phase two, which we'll actually talk about because the um, Air Force has a direct to phase two program. But most agencies have no mechanism for that. You have to follow that chain. So phase three is selling. You're commercializing it now. Your phase one proved the science. Your phase two, you built your prototype. You saw that I can make a bunch of these. Now phase three, you're selling it to somebody. And really with the government, they don't care who you're selling it to. It has to just have that commercialization piece. So you can sell it to agencies within the government. Like when we get into the DOD specific information, as I mentioned, nine times out of 10, DOD is gonna be your uh, customer. But it may not be that agency. You may actually get an Army uh, DOD Cyber Award, and at the end of the day, the Navy may be a lot better fit for the customer for that uh, product. It can be the commercial market. So you could be selling these on every end cap across um, America and every Walmart there is. Or it could be a couple one-offs. As long as there is a market for it, that's really what your phase three is about, is putting that technology into somebody else's hand. Now, there is very limited direct funding. The reason it says limited is um, GSA, the General Services Administration, I know way too many government acronyms, um, offers some very, very limited phase three direct funding but that is extremely hit or miss because it was a pilot program. I'm not sure if the pilot program is actually still in existence. So don't count on direct funding. But the reason we say direct funding is there's a lot of indirect funding. So there's things like phase two extensions, there's things like commercialization readiness, there's things like rapid innovation funds. There are other programs that can help you kind of get to that next step, get to that next phase. So why pursue super funding? Well, I hear this question a lot. It's essentially free money. Yes, yes, I know there is no such thing as a free lunch because you have to put work into this. Don't forget to pay yourself. It's always the way you screw yourself. But it really is a government seed fund. So it's a way for you to get money to develop your idea, to grow your business, and to be successful. If you went to a venture capitalist and you said, I have this really great idea, well, and they say, well, let me hear about it. You say, well, 
I need you to give me $150,000 and I need you to give me 12 months to actually see if it's going to work. But I'm not going to give you any part of my business. They will call security. <laughs> but that's what these programs are all about. It's a way for the government to put money into you so you can grow and test out the idea because it is risk-free dollars. You don't have to pay it back. They want no portion of the idea and they want no portion of your business. Government's got better things to do than try to run your business remotely for 20% for $200,000. So again, no equity taken, but it also gives you, and I have to kind of underscore this one because a lot of people don't understand the value of this. It gives you a priority position for sole source sales to the government. An example, DOD and NASA. People go, well, why does that matter? When DOD wants to buy a product from you, they have to do an open competition. They have to put together an RFP, RFQ, RFI, RF whatever, push the information out and say, we're looking for a product that does this, go. And at that point, if you're selling you know, a UAV, you're competing against Raytheon, you're competing against you know, Honeywell, you're competing against every other company that makes UAVs. However, if they provided funding through something like a Cibber Award, that means they've helped grow the technology. They can actually make a sole source priority sale rather than opening it up to the Raytheons, the Honeywells, the you know, BAEs of the world that you have to compete against. They can sell direct or they can buy directly from you. And that's huge because it cuts off all those banks where the guys can you know, make pennies of profit on something because they are such industrial complex. And it provides a pathway to commercialize your innovation. A lot of people, when they're just starting out, don't understand how much money goes into R&D funding with your company. When you track out most companies over like a five-year period, R&D is probably about 60% of your expenses. This is a way to cut, uh, cut that off way to actually offset that technical risk for you to get money, for you to develop this product and this idea without putting yourself in the poorhouse and eating raw. So a couple, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple examples of civil funded companies. A lot of people up here will recognize some big names. For example, uh, Qualcomm, Symantec, uh, 23andMe, all of these companies got started off of civil funding. So Symantec, the people that send you those annoying pop-ups about renewing your antivirus, they got started with cyber funding. And people go, well, why does the government buy into that? Because it's always not direct dollars. Um, one of the things to that, uh, well, I'm off on my slides. We'll talk about that real quick here. <laughs> but so under the DOD SBR program, for FY17, these were the award obligations. As you can see, uh, it's $946 million that they obligated to awards. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that all that money went out because again, contracting stuff, contracts may have gotten signed late, they may have gotten pushed over into FY18, but this just shows the amount of money that goes out. Uh, DOD and HHS, which is NIH, um, HHS is Health and Human Services. NIH is one of the components of HHS, but most people just know it as the NIH server program. Uh, they always buy back and forth between who is the biggest funder of this um, and who makes the most awards, who makes the most obligations. So the entire purpose of the DOD SBR program, again, is to solve those issues that they're facing. So their war fighters out in the field are facing an issue, are the ones that are transitioning back from the field to civilian life have a problem, are their supply chains, they can't get the supplies where they need it. So they use the SBR program. Um, they really have issues that need to be addressed to enable better or more efficient military endeavors, uh, either protecting the warfighters for, while serving and even protecting the warfighters after serving. Uh, and they want to grow small businesses so they are part of the acquisition ecosystem. So what we mean there by the acquisition ecosystem is getting back to that idea that you can be a sole, um, you can be a priority sole source awardee for the government. So DOD can't buy those things directly from you. They don't have to go through their big supply chains. Uh, annually, over half of the uh, DOD awards are to businesses with less than 25 people. So those are your basic average small businesses. 
uh, because one of the criteria of being a small business by a CIVR definition is having less than 500 employees. If you have almost 500 employees, you probably don't need these programs. You're pretty fake business in my eyes. But And then a third of the awards actually are to businesses with less than 10 employees. So those businesses that are right around the corner that are down the street that you know that your neighbor is uh, operating, about a third of the uh, total awards from DOD go to businesses like that. Um, and typically, about a quarter are first-time winners. So they're people that have never won an award. They're people that have never gotten into the ecosystem. And this is a way to get them in there. Uh, and then again, allows for sole source acquisitions. So the DOD funds three times a year. Uh, typically, it will open in January, May, and September. As I mentioned earlier, the topic areas are very specialized because they are trying to solve that specific problem about what's going on, how can I address this? I don't have it in this presentation, but we used to have one about it. Uh, we would actually pull out some of the abstract information from a DOD topic area. And you will find very specific information in there, like one of them one year, I believe it was Army, was looking for a technology because they were looking at uh, rail guns. And they said, well, when we fire this type of projectile, we need a buttressing system that can handle this uh, temperature range and this shock force. And people go, well, that's weird. Who's working on that? Somebody is, because the DOD found out about it and wanted to fund it. So that's why they'll be very, very specific, and that's why they'll drill down very tightly, is that it's an actual real-world problem that they're trying to solve. Uh, under uh, DOD servers, um, it can actually include product development and testing. So most of them, again, as I said, it's that three-phase program where phase one is concept, phase two is uh, prototype. Depending on the topic area, there can be some low-level prototype development within a phase one, but it'll actually tell you in the phase one topic area whether what all they require, what are the objectives you have to hit, and what are the milestones they expect out of you. Uh, DOD has kind of an interesting mechanism. Um, when we say that they are open, um, typically in January, May, and September, that's because first they do what they call a pre-release. So they'll actually put out their expected topic areas. And at that point, you can contact the um, top uh, TPOC, the technical point of contact. And they're the people that can tell you, well, this is the technologies we're looking for. What are you working on? That seems interesting. That's not really a fit for us hey, that might be something we'll look at in the future. You're open to talk to them and find out more about what they're looking for for about a 30-day period. After that, they close it, and some of those topic areas will actually disappear. I've seen that happen where you get the amended instructions, and there's about five to ten less topic areas because they found out something, or they needed to actually go back to the drawing board, or they needed to reframe the language of it. At that point, it'll go into what's called open status. You have about a 30-day window under open status that you can actually submit your proposal package, but at that same time, you're not allowed to directly contact the TPOX anymore. You have to submit all your questions and answers through what they call CITIS, S-I-T-I-S. That is one acronym I don't have down. Don't ask me what it stands for. But the T's topics, it's something about that. But you actually ask them questions. You submit your questions through there. If they answer it, they publish the answer. Don't put proprietary information in there because then it's available for the entire world to see. But, and that's why you're not allowed to contact the teapots directly, is at that point it's open competition. They can't give you a leg up on the competition. That's why it's called open competition. Everybody starts out at the same level. And again, though the customer will typically be DOD, um, a lot of times it'll actually be a different department then that technical point of contact. So if someone is working in sensor technologies for USAF, it doesn't mean that you're gonna sell your technology to the sensors department of the USAF. It might be the unmanned aerial systems, or it may be somebody else. So while DOD is probably your customer, it's not gonna be like, hey, we're gonna buy this from you. It's like, well, we know where your customer is at. Let us put you in touch with them. Um, Mike can actually probably speak to that. But uh, made up of 12 service components, and each component can actually have different requirements and funding levels. 
uh, one thing that you will find when you look at the instruction packets is there is a general instructions for Department of Defense, and then all of the components that actually have topic areas will have their own instructions, because you may have things like an option period where you have to actually bid the option period. Option doesn't mean optional. I know, strange, but our funding levels change. So it may be $167,000 with a phase one option for Army, maybe $150,000 for a phase one with Navy because they don't have an option. It may be, what is it, $150,000 uh, for six months now with USAF. It depends greatly. So when you're looking at those instructions, always pay attention to the individual service component. And the easy way to do that is they're the ones that publish the individual topic areas. So you don't know who has that topic area until you start paying attention to those uh, service component instructions. At that point, pay attention to what they're actually saying. Um, don't just skim through it and look at the topics. I know people want to do that because we used to do that. But these are the different ones. So obviously Army, Navy, Air Force, um, Missile Defense Agency, uh, Defense Threat Reduction Agency. I'm not going to go through all these because those are very long terms. But everybody kind of has that specialization and that focus. You know, someone like um, SOCOM, the Special Operations Command, they have very specific technologies they're looking for to help their mission. Uh, for instance, three-ish cycles ago, SOCOM had a topic area that they wanted technologies that could actually allow SEALs to reach REM sleep faster so that when they slept for two hours, it actually be refreshed. So that's kind of how granular these can get. And you have to kind of pay attention to, I'm looking at this, this is what I'm doing. I need to find out what these individual agencies or service components missions are. Because their topic areas are almost always going to wrap around their mission statements in some form or fashion. So we talk about the SBIR and STTR programs. Um, Innovation is a big thing. In SBIR, the I stands for innovation. And what they mean by innovation is the basic definition of innovation is you're doing something new with less resources for a different result. Bar none, that's innovation. So for them, innovation is it's unique, it's novel, it's something that's not being done. But it does not mean high tech, it doesn't mean you're firing up the DeLorean and getting it up to 88 miles an hour so you can go back in time. That's, you know, future tech. Sure, there is some future tech stuff in there, but innovation kind of comes in all forms. Innovation can be a product. It can be a service. It can be a type. Innovation can be a bunch of different things. A great example, uh, which is right in here, is DOD has actually funded a CIVR to do comic books for PTSD patients. So comic books, things that you bought for 10 cents back in the 1950s. They received funding so that the PTSD patient could actually see how I'm supposed to interact in the world now that I've gotten back. What am I going through? What are other people going through? It's kind of that health intervention style technology. So with innovation, it's not just that this is gonna be the newest thing. A lot of really basic low-tech stuff, too, that they just need. Um, great example here. In the 19.1 BAA, the Army needed heated gloves for soldiers, um, particularly, I guess, over in Afghanistan. It gets pretty damn cold in the mornings, and when you're out on the rifle range, you want to be able to move your fingers. So they wanted heated dexterous gloves for soldiers so that it wouldn't impact their mission. That was a cyber topic area. So if you came up with a heated glove, might have been funding for it. A big thing about somebody like the Air Force is the Air Force is interested in anything, and um, Gabe will explain a little bit more about that uh, here shortly, but they're kind of that first service component to roll out that idea about, tell me what you're working on. Pitch your idea to me. Tell me why I need to fund this. And they fund across a lot of different areas. So DOD looks at a lot of very different technologies. Uh, it could be autonomous systems, cybersecurity uh, improvements. As we mentioned, things like health intervention, mental health intervention, even game theory. So I don't mean game like video games, although that plays into it. 
but game theory about how do you do an echelon mission better and how do you get better results out of it? Um, what is the payoff? Um, human interface solutions. So that kind of human robotic trust issue are being able to trust the information that's put up to you on a uh, display through things like VR and AR. Uh, DOD funds across a bunch of different stuff. So one thing that people always say is, well, DOD is not going to be interested in why I'm making. I'm not making weapons. Yeah, that's one thing that they do, but they do a whole lot of other stuff. Just because you don't see an initial fit and because you're not making a technology for someone to kill somebody with doesn't mean that DOD is not interested in there's a bunch of different stuff they look at because they have such a wide mission and they are buried across all those different components. So when I talked about kind of how does innovation lead to better products, this is actually a really great example of a silver funded company. So iRobot was silver funded. People that make that little hockey puck that goes around and, you know, probably doesn't do a great job. I don't know. I don't have one. I'm not buying one for $300 from Sharper Image. But iRobot got 30 DoD awards between 2001 and 2009, totaling over $10 million. They now employ 450 people. People that make the Roomba got their start with DoD. And people go, well, I don't see. Why would DoD want that? Well, DoD didn't want that. What DoD wanted was DoD robots. So iRobot started off with DoD by making Explosive Ordnance Disposal or, uh, disposal Robots. iRobot took the basic technology out of there about moving things around, about seeing a clear sight, about knowing when it's going to tip, and they created that little thing that you can buy from every catalog out there, from every as seen on TV shop. So again, when you're looking at innovation, it's not just about that kind of end-all, be-all goal. It's how do I get there? What am I working on? Can I make something better out of this? Because those turned into the Roomba. And iRobot made millions upon millions upon who knows how many millions of dollars off of it. So again, really it's just about the commercial merit. Who's going to buy it, if anyone's going to buy it, and why is it important? Even under DoD, though they are going to be your customer, as I said, nine times out of ten, you have to have that plan of who else are you going to sell it to. Just in case it turns out at the very end of the day that while the technology is great and while the product is amazing, it may not fit into the DoD life cycle or it may not fit into their supply chain. You have to know who else is going to be interested in this technology. Again, um, your customer is probably not going to be that contracting officer, the person that signed that contract and nurtured you all the way through. Or maybe a different department within DOD, or again, maybe DOD is not the actual customer. But when you're talking to DOD and you're talking about what you're working on, you have to know where all can it fit. It's because it's not just about selling it to DOD, it's about selling it to other federal agencies. It's about finding a commercial you know, vendor <laughs> out in the world. Or it's about being able to pull a partner with someone like Raytheon and selling a technology to them. Uh, so the big reason of why DOD really focuses on commercialization is commercialization drives jobs. That's kind of just natural. And that really wraps into the entire fact that these are a seed fund because the government is making an investment into your company. It will go, well, you know, what's the catch? Even when I go to a venture capitalist, they want part of my idea. They want part of my business. The government doesn't want any. Well, the government wants it's what comes out of that. So when you grow, you hire more people, you sell more products, you make more money. Guess what also increases? Your tax base. You pay more taxes. So the government at the end gets that return on investment. They made more money because you're successful. That's all they want out of you. They want you to be able to create more jobs, increase productivity, and spur economic growth and competition. Uh, there's a lot of duplicate information here. But again, they want to know, when you're putting together your proposal package, the agency, non-agency, and commercial market people that are going to buy this technology. And DOD also has um, additional funding. So as I said, towards the beginning, while there is very limited um, phase three direct funding, I always hate that it should just be none, but there is other um, enhancement programs like the phase two enhancement which is designed to actually help you move that successful phase two further along to the commercial market. 
are the commercialization readiness program, which um, if you're interested in that, Mike can definitely speak to you about that. And then um, like DIUX, which is very similar to the server program in that it's spurring that innovation, it's spurring that growth. So just because you may not be a direct match for Civer, doesn't mean that there's not other funding that may be out there for you with DOD. So now we get kind of to the meat and potatoes, uh, USAF. So USAF, uh, United States Air Force, sorry about the acronyms. Uh, their products, or products, Jesus. their programs have radically changed over the fat, uh, past few um, BAA, broad agency announcement cycles. Um, the latest instructions actually really streamlined the proposal process, and I looked at these a couple weeks ago and it kind of blew my mind. So all of their topics now only require a five-page technical volume. Uh, it used to be a 15-page pretty much across the board or a 20-page, depending, but now it's just five pages. Tell us what you're working on. Tell us why it's unique. Tell us what we need to know about it. Um, and then it requires a 15-slide pitch deck, depending on the actual the market or the actual topic area it falls into. There can be other requirements, but across the board, these are the uh, minimum things you're going to have to prepare for a US USAF proposal package. Uh, they want a work plan that actually uh, is an outline at the beginning of your uh, technical volume that covers all of the uh, key factors like your scope, your milestones, your reporting. And even though now it's only five pages, they still want you to follow those 11 different sections, so be very, very concise. Um, anybody that's a math whiz knows that looks less, less than half a page for each one of those sections, so sum stuff up. Um, and then the cost volume now requires an itemized list of costs. So it used to be that you would actually submit the cost volume on the website, uh, defensebit, defensebiz whatever the rest of it is. Um, they have to really have their own portal for submitting a DOD proposal. Now they want a big kind of list about why are you requesting all of these different items for your budget. And then within um, US Air Force, there's kind of these different delineations. And I'm gonna give you a brief overview. Do you wanna provide more kind of flavor about these, um, Gabe? Yeah. So with USAF, uh, on this slide and the next slide, we'll talk about, they have what they call pitch days, which are essentially just, what are you working on? And you're working on something unique. If I like it enough, you're gonna to come to DC and you're gonna to talk to me about it. You're actually gonna make a pitch to them just like you do with a venture capitalist. If they like the idea when you pitch it in DC, you'll actually come out of it, you'll sign a contract with them, and they will give you, well, I was gonna say they'll give you a check, but it's actually not. You have to be set up beforehand to take government credit card because you, they will swipe the card, you will get 75K, I think it is. Yeah, 75K or whatever your budget requires. That's one of the things, when you put together a civil proposal package, never undercut the money. Uh, if they allow you to take up to 150K, take every red cent that you can. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people fall into, particularly if you come from academia, is you think that if you're not taking all of the 150K, then you're being more competitive they're more likely to put money into you. No, they do not care. Take every red cent that you can. And then they have the open topics, which the open topics are really kind of the just, what are you working on? It doesn't really matter if it fits directly into my topic area or into my scope. I want to know what's different, what's unique. The open topics are kind of a very short process although they do require the five-page technical and the 15-slide deck, it's a very short period of performance. So kind of the reasoning behind the open topics, and correct me if I misspeak here, Gabe, was that these are products that are almost ready to roll out into the market, or that they're in the market and there's a different use for them, that it can actually happen within the Air Force. So that's why it's 50K for a two-month technical and one-month reporting. It's really about how is what you're working on going to fit within Air Force? Let's take these two months and actually figure it out. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I just wanted to say thanks to Dell. She really or uh, pleased to be working with them on this because they're doing a great job at opening. 
the uh, so I work at the Air Force Research Lab here locally. Uh, I sit over here in our tech engagement office, um, in the Rainforest Building here. Um, the, the new administration and the new leadership of the Air Force is doing as much as they can to make it easier for small businesses to work with um, the Air Force. And so part of their um, experiments to try to make that happen is using the SIPR process and modifying the SIPR process um, to allow this. So the open topics, um, as Bell said, are really created not so much for you to take some basic level research and productize it. They still have the traditional process for that. This is more looking at more mature um, products or services that you as a company might have that we as the Air Force maybe just don't know about yet. So they want you to come and say, hey, we have this new thing, would you like to look at it? If you get one of these awards, the reason it's so short is they really want you to do a lot of work during that period of time, not so much working on the technology as much as going out and finding um, defense uh, end users and stakeholders who might be able to use that product or service for their particular system or whatever it might be. Um, so a lot of that time is really spent doing, um, allowing you, essentially paying you to do customer discovery on your behalf um, with the D Department of Defense. And then at the end, when you report out about what you've done, they're not only looking for, hey, this is a cool tech thing that you have, but who who did you find that might actually be um, that might actually find this useful for their their mission? And they will consider those more strongly. More, you know, they'll put a little bit more emphasis on those that have that sort of traction at the end to consider for uh, further phases. Um, so yeah, it's more for it's looking more for commercial products or services than the traditional route. The pitch day topics that he previously mentioned, they're sort of attached to that open topic scheme. They're sort of kind of joint things. In some cases, you may see pitch day topics listed in a particular call that are based on uh, having already received a phase one sibber. In some cases, they'll simply say, come and pitch to us and do all the due diligence to submit your proposal. You're gonna you're gonna see variations on a theme for the next several calls as to what what these pitch day topics are, and they'll be a roll they'll be rolled out. Um, the first one was held in New York City, but you may start seeing these in a lot more places across the country, where you submit your proposal and then if they like it, they'll invite you to whatever location to do the pitch to be. Yeah, and the uh, nineteen dot three it actually calls out that you'll go to a DC. So, uh, see, right. Yeah. There's one coming up in November for space. It's a space emphasis, the space sector. Um, but unfortunately, that is only for companies who have already had phase. They basically curated a select group of companies that have already received phase ones. And the pitch day will be about giving the phase twos out. The pitch day in and of itself is really a, a construction to help drive down the award process for, for giving out money. Because as you know, the government has traditionally taken a long time to make awards. The Air Force is working really hard, really hard to try to shorten that process. Pitch day is one of the one of the specific efforts to do that. Yeah, a really great thing that actually, um, as Gabe mentioned, the pitch day is kind of shorten that time period before you get the money. So anyone that's ever worked on a government contract, uh, particularly for someone like DOD, uh, and this might actually vary but based on service component, I don't have that granular level of knowledge, but what will happen a lot of times is you'll incur costs for 30 days, and you'll pull together your uh, whatever your accounting is, and you'll actually send a quote for services that were rendered during that 30-day period to someone like DOD. A lot of times, you'll have 30 days to do that. And then sometimes it'll be an additional 15 days before they issue you money or cut you a check. So that could be a cycle of almost up to 45 to 60 days that you're out cost. Um, particularly for a small business, if you're just starting out, it's very hard to cover costs for innovation development for a 60 day cycle. The pitch day topics, as I said, they swipe a card and you have your money right then and there. You also know immediately whether they're funding you because most of these have anywhere between a three month to a five month notification window. As the very first 30 days after you submit is administrative review. 
they go through. Did you sign all your, or uh, cross all your T's, dot all your I's? Is everything in there that it needs to be? If not, they do what's called kick it out and they return it without review. Anybody that's ever had that happen to you knows that that process sucks because you just spend 120 hours on average working on a proposal nobody will look at because you forgot to do something. Uh, I've done some of these with uh, like uh, people from um, uh, PTAC, the Pro Procurement <coughs> Technical Assistance Center. And one of the ladies I did it with always loved to tell the story of a guy she worked with who, it wasn't a sieber, but it was something very similar that was putting together a proposal and he was last minute. He actually ran into their offices because they had to submit for him and he had to run up six flights of stairs just to get up to her office on time so that they could submit. She submitted it very last second, about 30 seconds left before the clock ticked. You know, they said their thanks, they shook their hands, guy went downstairs, had a heart attack in the lobby. And she actually, about 30 minutes later, had to call his cell phone. She didn't even know about it and called his cell phone while he was in the hospital because he forgot to sign a form. So he gave himself a heart attack about a proposal that never went in. Don't wait till the last minute. I realize that is a very dark story, but <laughs> it kind of underscores that it's very, very easy to mess up yourself up along the way. And I say that because I got a couple more slides here, but I'm going to link that. I'm not just telling you a weird story out of nowhere. So uh, USAF also has a, what they call their directive phase two um, open topics. Uh, there's two different vehicles. One is fully um, cyber funded and the other is called the rapid program. Rapid requires a typically one to one match, um, sometimes a 0 0.5 to one match. But and why I said at the top about the gated program is for 99% of the time, you're going to go from a phase one to a phase two. While there are some direct to phase two options, you pretty much have had to already take on the phase one work, done it all on your own dime before you're eligible for a direct to phase two. The reason they have these is because you've already done your technical feasibility. You may have built a prototype. There may be stuff that wouldn't make sense to fund for a phase one, but almost always this is going to be for companies that have been, you know, established in the game for, you know, five, six, seven years or longer because they've had that time to do the uh, groundwork beforehand. So that's why I really don't like to talk about the direct to phase two because people go, well, I can do that. And it's like, they're, hang on, let's have, a, let's have a heart to heart here. You have to have these very specific metrics in front of you. But USAF does actually have that opportunity. It requires a little bit more than what the um, phase one is. Uh, you'll see that one of the very strange things is you have to have a 100 second uh, sales pitch video that goes up on, I say YouTube here, that's what everybody knows. It just says some publicly available website. So the YouTube and TikTok, whatever else you're using, just people are used to YouTube. And it requires a pitch video call with the evaluators. So you may submit the proposal. One of the very first evaluation criteria is you're going to have a call, a video call, with the evaluators where you're just going to have to convince them, I've done all the phase one work, I'm ready for a phase two. Yeah, I would say that they're really looking for more mature technology. It's almost their variation of what the DIU is trying to do, it, which is we understand that there are companies out there that may already be mature about, and we want to see what that is. I've also been told that the likelihood of companies getting phase, those direct phase twos is very low. So. Not I'm not discouraging you anyway from submitting those, but the chances are a lot lower than phase one. Well, and even in the um, instruction packets for Air Force, it tells you the likelihood of you getting a direct to phase two is very low. We do not fund a lot of these, and they mean it. Uh, this is just a real quick graphic of what the um, specific program overview looks like for the USAF. As you can see, the commercialization readiness program runs under pretty much all the phases. Again, that's Mike. There's not a lot of great information out there about the CRP that I can pull, and I don't want to misspeak. But Mike actually works your work for the CRP program, right? For the U.S. Air Force. 
So I gave you a lot of information. I told you a lot of do's and don'ts. I told you about a lot of the pitfalls and tricks, the things, oh, hang on, I don't want to say tricks, but the things that you can actually <laughs> fall into and the hurdles that you have to overcome. And a lot of people now go, well, this sounds like a really onerous process. It can be, but there are partner organizations out there that can help you, like NEMFAST. So as I mentioned at the very top of the program, NMFAST is uh, funded by a cooperative agreement with the SBA. We are funded on a yearly basis to help small businesses go after SBIR and STTR funding. That's pretty much our entire purpose. We work out of the Arrowhead Center at New Mexico State University. So yes, I drove up earlier today from Las Cruces and I will be driving back later tonight to Las Cruces. But we have a lot of programs that will help small businesses. All we're doing is trying to get you to the next step. And our programs, well, for most of the businesses, will never cost us any. Um, some of them you even get money. For fast, you don't get the money. We run a very tight ship. We have no budget. <laughs> but we provide a lot of services. So we do things like this, where I come to an area and I get up in front of you for an hour and kind of just talk and sometimes make sense, sometimes don't. We have a lot of things like compliance matrices. So we'll actually go through those specific instruction packets and pull out the relevant information so that you know, section by section, word by word, do I have the right stuff together? Because um, particularly with like a 20 page technical volume or even now a five page technical volume, you have to make sure you're hitting the relevant information. If you're not, the likelihood of you being uh, funded kind of plummets. Uh, we do things like checklists. Uh, we tell our services for each client, so it's not like you come to us and we go, okay, well, here's our website. You go do modules A through C. That's exactly what everybody does. No, we actually sit down with you and we talk with you, which, again, there's a piece of paper in the back for people to sign up for one-on-ones. If you want to sit down and talk with me afterwards or you want to talk with Gabe or Matt about your idea, what you're working on, talk with Mike. We're all available to talk with but we tailor everything we do. So you tell us what you're doing. We'll find things like the agency match for you. Are you a great fit for Air Force? Are you a better fit for someone like NASA? Is the Department of Energy going to be really interested in your technology? We'll do topic matching. We'll also do reviews where you can send us what you're working on, and we'll look it over for compliance. We'll make sure that it actually flows, that you're hitting the right things. We do a lot of stuff. Um, and for warning, sometimes it takes us a few days to get to stuff. We run a two-person operation, so I am one of the pack mules. Um, just know that sometimes it takes us a little while to get to it, but we're here to help you in any way we can. We do things like a monthly newsletter. This is an example of it from November of last year. As you can see, we talk about the Sibri events going on. We talk about some monthly highlights, like what's new, what's happening, what do you need to know about, like the SBIR matching program that the Economic Development Department in New Mexico has, as well as the Innovation Vouchers program. If you're a small business and you don't know about those programs, go to the NMEDD website. They can actually provide a lot of money for you to grow your business. And even things like the agency updates, so what happened, what's new, You'll see these YouTube links because we do video podcast series. So I've been recording this workshop the entire time, or at least, oh God, I hope it's still recording. Um, this will go up on our YouTube channel. If you're already sick of hearing my voice, don't go to the YouTube channel. It's about 148 videos of me talking. You don't want to subject yourself to that. But really, again, it's about what can we do for you? How can we help you take that next stage? The only thing we don't do is we don't write content for you. So again, we provide solicitation guides, we do videos, we do checklists, we do compliance matrices. If you come to me and say, hey, Dell, can you write this section for me? It's going to be a resounding no. <laughs> One, we're not funded for that. We actually can't do that. That breaks a lot of rules with SBA, and I don't want to get fired. I do like my job. Um, and two, I don't know your idea. You know your idea best. I can't talk about why your idea is innovative. We can have a 15-minute conversation, and I go, you know, but that's really unique. You want me to try and convince an agency reviewer about that? Good luck. That's just not our bag. But we do pretty much everything else aside from create content for you. 
Uh, we also have what we call our kind of phase zero program. It's modeled after some of the other phase zero programs like Department of Energy. We can provide very limited micro grants where we'll actually have some funding available for you to work with someone that can do things like write a section of your proposal. Always recommend that maybe don't use it for that because again, you know your idea best, but if you want technical editing, if you want DCAA compliance, which DCAA is Defense Contracting Audit Agency. I think that's what DCAA stands for. Um, if you don't know what DCAA compliance is and you want to be a civil awardee under DOD, find out about it quick. If you are not within DCAA compliance, you will get audited, mostly during the phase two. You don't really have to worry that much about it during phase one. But that's always the biggest way to give yourself an ulcer is to have a federal auditor knocking on your door. So we can actually provide funding for you to work with a DCA officer or a DCA compliance person to make sure that your budget is in line. Or even conference registration. There's a lot of conferences that go on each year around the CIVR. Um, Greg can tell you about us providing conference uh, registration and funding. Uh, we went to uh, National Harbor uh, for the uh, CIVR conference this spring. So, uh, a couple years ago, but yeah. also went to Austin. That's right. Are you saying that that micro grant will pay for that? Yes, um, we provide. It's a sliding scale. Um, it's dictated by the need, and again, it's limited. We don't get a lot of money. It's not like we got a million dollars that you know we parcel out on small chunks. We have very limited funding, but if you need it, we can actually provide funding for that. And we work with uh, service providers that we've already vetted. So it's people that we have agreements with. It's people that we set up the statement of work with. You don't need to worry about paying them and then trying to get money out of us. We actually pay them directly to work with you. So in summary, you know, we assist you, we provide a bunch of tools, we help guide you along the process. So where are you making those mistakes? How can you actually make a better proposal package? And how do you make sure that your proposal package is complete and compelling? Because that's always kind of the key one that people forget. They go, well, it's all together, it's complete. Is it interesting? Is it something that's actually going to grab the reviewer? Is it compelling? If you can't answer that in the affirmative, maybe wait till the next cycle. Um, because if you're not grabbing their attention, it's really hard to get them enthused about your idea. Because remember, at the end of the day, the people that are reviewing these are human. They have to be interested in your technology. If I gave somebody a book and said, this book sucks, it's only 15 pages long, though, just read it, likelihood of them finishing it is low. If I hand them a book and say, this book's 15 pages long, it's going to be the best 15 pages you ever read because of, you know, A, B, and C, they're going to read it fully and they're going to digest that information. The exact same with reviewers and technical proposals. Make it interesting. Make it unique. We'll make sure to give you guidance on how to do that. And I'll look it over and tell you whether I fell asleep that night reading it or not. And again, we offer things like micro grants to go to things like conferences and workshops events such as, ah, slides are backwards. I'm gonna talk about this one more fast before going to the next one. On December 11th, we're gonna do our third annual, what we call the uh, New Mexico SBIR STTR Innovation Summit. We're gonna have uh, key decision makers and program managers from a few different um, Naval departments as well as Air Force. They're gonna talk about what they're working on, how they're doing stuff differently. You're gonna have the chance to actually sit down with them one-on-one -on -one discuss your idea and see if it's interesting to them. It's actually a big thing. It's very rare that you get the chance to sit down one-on-one -on -one with federal program managers. Um, typically, it only happens twice a year, once in the early or late spring time, um, sometimes in Anaheim, sometimes in Austin, or sometimes in National Harbor, and then during the fall because it'll happen at the Tech Connect event. The likelihood of you actually getting down, getting the chance to sit down with that federal program manager and talk directly about your idea, if it's not at one of those two events, it's pretty slim. So we like to really play this one up. It's only $35 to attend. Um, and for this year, we have held it at the Albuquerque Convention Center in past years. It might be at a different place. More information will actually follow, but there's the uh, website for the event. If you are interested in receiving SBIR funding for your idea, and you're going to be in Albuquerque on the 11th. Take the time out. Go to this. It's worth the 35 bucks. 
I don't say it because it helps offset the program costs for us, but it is actually a really valuable thing. Um, you'll see me there running around like a chicken with my head cut off because I do all the IT for it. But it's a great way to find out more about the programs and just to find out is what I'm working on unique and interesting enough to somebody. And one of the things that you can do to get there is we have a program that we started up last year called the Arrowhead Center SBIR Accelerator, ACSA. So the ACSA is a limited time program um, we do in cycles. We have two different ones that we run. One is a generalized, which kind of go, uh, covers that SBIR 101. This time we're going to run a six-week one. Applications are open now. Um, applications close October 18th, but for six weeks, it's a weekly meeting. There will be some homework assignments, but it's really about what can the SBIR programs do for you? What are you working on that's actually unique? What are you working on that's novel? Is this a valid way for you to go forward? Who's your best agency? So we take you through that guided process and really kind of nail down what is your path forward? What is the best way you can get to that next hurdle? The best thing about it, it's free. There is no money. It just takes some time. And then we also will be running a DOD-focused one because we run the generalized ones that are six weeks or five weeks. Depending. And then we run the agency-specific ones that are anywhere between 10 and 12 weeks because we guide you through that entire process of creating a proposal package for that agency. Uh, last year, we started up with our pilot program. Uh, this year, the applications will be opening soon uh, because it will start sometime in November. So it's not a lot of time between then and now. But we did it starting last November. We took 10 companies through the entire proposal creation process from start to finish. From I don't even know what registrations I have to do to I just submitted a uh, SBIR proposal package to the DOD. The reason we know they did is I sat with them, looked over their shoulder, and made sure that they hit the submit button. And we went through every single section. We went through the budget. We connected them with budget compliance officers that could tell them, well, this is what I have. I don't know what my indirect rate is. Well, let's help you figure that out. Or this is what I'm working on. I don't even know who I pitched this to. Well, let's take a look at the topic areas. So we provide those two different programs um, you can go to that website. All these hyperlinks will be active in the PDF I send out after this because we will send this out to everybody that attended. But if you're interested in cyber stuff and you just don't know what's the next step, where do I go from here, check out one of the programs. Whether you just need general information <coughs> or whether you're putting together a DOD one or uh, whether in the future you're looking at NSF, NIH, or NASA, because those are the ones in the hopper, we're going to, if everything works out, we'll be running eight of these this year, which means I'm going to be very busy. But it doesn't matter who you're looking at. We have services and we have support for you. We are here to help you. Just, again, bar none. We want you to succeed. If you don't succeed, it looks bad on me. I'm not going to get hired again. I don't like living the ramen life. So I like eating well, and I need a job to do that. So just kind of thank you um, for attending. You know, and I want to thank um, Gabe, Matt, and Mike for allowing us to have this opportunity to come in and kind of talk about what we do, and kind of in that focus of what all does the Air Force look at? As, as Gabe's mentioned, um, I don't think you mentioned it here, but you mentioned it before, the Air Force looks at a lot of different stuff. Um, there's always solutions that they need and just because you have something that you don't think is a solution for them doesn't mean it's actually not a solution. One of the things I always like to tell people when I start working with them, and they start describing what they're working on, they'll miss the forest for the trees. They're so hyper-focused on one product, for one customer, for one segment. And then I get to talking with them, and it's like, well, okay, well, that thing sounds, yeah, cool. There's a guy that's going to purchase it. How'd you get there, though? What are you doing? What are you doing that's different? And they go, well, you know, I wrote this really, you know, cool data analytics program. And you go, well, you wrote it yourself? What does it do? Oh, it does this and this and this. And you go, realize there's funding for that, right? Don't miss a forest for the trees. Kind of take that 35,000 foot level. Because data analytics is something that every single agency and organization out there could use. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, 
Virtual reality, augmented reality, that's something that every single agency is looking at across the 12 different agencies. So don't focus down too hardcore because you're going to miss opportunities in front of you. And that's always the worst thing you can do. Coming from somebody that has been in industry a couple different times, don't ever cut yourself short because you never know where that next door is going to open. 